Good morning, brothers and sisters. Very happy Sabbath to each one of you that are here for this meeting and for those that will view this later. Would you join with me now in a word of prayer so that we may ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that our minds may be open to understand that which he would have us to know at this time. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for this opportunity we have to grow, to learn, and to draw closer to you. Help us as we join together that we may learn, that we may have a study that opens our minds, prepares us for all that we are to be doing. Help us now, direct us, so that which we do may be according to your will. May your angels attend us. May we look to walk closer with you in all things. Help us now, guide us where we need to be. May your spirit be upon us so that we may indeed receive the golden oil that you would give to us. For this, Father, we ask. In this, we pray. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We've been going over several things in the last couple of weeks. As we have been going through this from Zechariah 4, the question had been asked, who are these anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth? And this is the the question, the answer that is being given to Zechariah. Because Zechariah does not know who they are. A couple of weeks ago, we covered that the anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth have the position once given to Satan as covering cherub. We also have understood that the golden oil is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, into what from the book of Zechariah in chapter 4 is the golden oil poured. Poured into the golden bowls, which are hearts that want to receive God's word and God's spirit. Okay. Now, these golden bowls, are these pure? Yes. What other analogy is used within the New Testament to represent the golden bowls? The only thing that comes to mind right now is when Christ said, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For those who are who are receiving the word of God and want him. All right. Any other thoughts? Brothers and sisters, I'm I'm going to point out that the answer was directly in front of you. In the paragraph in the middle of the page that we're looking at, the one that is above this portion that is underlined, this paragraph begins, the oil 
with which the wise virgins filled their lamps represent the Holy Spirit. What do the lamps represent? Are the lamps not the light that we are to give to the world? So therefore, does not the golden bowls represent the wise virgins? All right. We also covered this point. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends us. Thus, we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. Is this not telling us that there is, we have a choice? That we have a choice to either accept what God is telling us or we have a choice to reject what God is telling us. We have a choice to stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel or under the black banner of the great apostate. And the end of this from Review and Herald, July 20th of 1897. By, refuse, by receiving the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, God's children shine as lights in the world. How can we shine if there is no oil within us? Well, we definitely need the Holy Spirit in order to shine. Agreed. Now, as we, as we go through a lot from here, there are, is quite a bit that our Heavenly Father would have us to understand. That we need to understand for us to be able to walk forward. With his own blood, Jesus appears in the presence of God as an intercessor for all who call upon his name. He is the advocate in behalf of the guilty. Who is guilty? Is there any on this earth, any in this world, that are not guilty? We're all guilty. We are all guilty. So there are none that are righteous. No, not one. Would that be a correct statement? Yep. So all of us here today are in need of the advocate. His blood cleanses from all sin those who accept him as their personal Savior. This is not a corporate Savior. This is someone, this is Christ who is personally accepted as our Savior. The memorial of his sufferings and death upon the cross, the penalty due to the transgressor, is efficacious for all who believe that this propitiation in the presence of God is a perpetual offering. Christ claims that the provision made entitles him to make the assurance to all who seek him. What does it mean to seek Christ? We go through a three-step prophetic testing message to see how our, our salvation is being worked out. 
for his sake, the prayers of the penitent who come to him acknowledging Christ as their Savior should be accepted as yea and amen, their sins blotted out, and the holy oil is bestowed upon them. Accepted, blotted out, holy oil bestowed. Is this not three steps? Yeah. Now, from Zechariah 4, 11 to 14, <clears throat> Mrs. White quotes, Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be those two olive branches which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Then he answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Here the messengers of God are represented by the olive branches, which through the golden pipe empty the golden oil out of themselves. This is the heavenly vital communication from God to every soul that is emptied of self. The heavenly oil communicated to the human agent is to be given to those who are consecrated channels to flow forth from them to others. Can this communication come to any that are not emptied of self? Now, my thought would say no. What do you think? What's the question? Can this communication from God come to any soul that is not emptied of self? Yeah, I don't think so. Because this isn't just normal communication. This is God directing and guiding a person. Right. Right. Plus, it says this heavenly vital connection from God to every soul, uh, from God to every soul who is emptied of self. So obviously, if we're not emptied of self, this type of communication can't happen. You know, one of the things when, when I think about, um, because this type of communication, what is this communication that, that she's talking about here? Like what's being communicated? Is it not the light that God would have us at the, to have at this time? Right. So this is uh, the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages. Okay. And... You know, what we see happening within the church, within this movement, um, is that there's lots of people believing that they have a message for this time. It could be Lunar Sabbath, it could be character of God, it could be anti-Trinitarianism, um, can even be stuff connected with Millerite history and the prophetic periods, Um you know, there's feast days, there's all kinds of things, all of these voices, and these all have some semblance of truth. There's some aspect in which people are um, yeah, using, they're using truth mixed with error uh, to press upon God's people that this is the message for this time. But the message for this time is... Um, comes from God, and, and we are me merely uh, channels through which this message comes. And this work to be done means that we need to be emptied of self. And there's so much of self in everything that's being said. 
even when people are often presenting truth, not just errors, but truth, there can be so much of self in there that it's not, it's not communicated. And so the responsibility for us individually is to get connected with God, to be empty of self so that God can use us. And, and he uses us in ways that we don't expect, that they're not according to man's ideas. Right? So I think this is an, an important message in understanding how the final work is going to be done on this earth. Where is our message to go first? Well, it would go first to us and then to those around us. If we were to, in our consideration with this with Zechariah 4, If we were to compare this with Ezekiel 9, then where is our message first to go? Well, it has to go to the church. Okay. Now, I'm going to shift back to the document that we were, we were examining last week. Here, Mrs. White states in Manuscript 186, paragraph 13, our work is to stop surmising evil of our brethren. What does that mean for us? Well, this is something that we've been, we've been presenting for quite a while in these studies. Yes. That we can't let our imaginations run wild about other people. We can't uh, pick at their faults in their personality or in how they present things um, as an excuse to reject light. And if this work is going to be accomplished, it's not going to be accomplished by fighting against one another. Right. And it, it's kind of discouraging because we don't see much pressing together at all. We see a lot of infighting. And, um, I mean, it's true of the church as well in how they treat people who differ, uh, who present what, you know, they consider to be light. Even if it's error, there's ways of, a, of addressing error according to the counsel given in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that is never followed. So we have not had a good example in the church or in this movement on how to deal with um, the differences that exist in individuals. And so, so this is a work that has to be done. It's one of the first works that has to be done is uh, to being reconciled to your brethren. I think all of us have seen churches ripped apart by rumor and innuendo. All of us have seen what has occurred because of some small slight. And that slight being blown up again and again and again. Here, Mrs. White is clear that our work is to stop surmising evil of our brethren. We should seek to press together and thus fulfill the longing of Christ to see his chosen people love one another as he loves them. Would we agree that this occurred during the meeting of the upper room? after Christ's ascension to the heavenly courts? Did the disciples come together? Did they press together 
confess their sins to one another and pray together. Did they become unified? After that, yeah. Here, Mrs. White quotes portions of Psalms 15. Now, when we're looking at this, when we are considering Psalms 15, we have for us a psalm of David asking the question, who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now, the psalm itself asks, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt. And changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. We're given an example, a structure by David. Did David have reason to be suspicious of Saul? Yeah. Did he verbally, physically, or in any other manner? Believe evil of Saul. No, probably he didn't believe evil of him. You know, evil is directing him, though. Well, as an example, here was David hiding in a cave. Saul steps into that cave to relieve himself. David cut a little bit off of the robe that Saul was wearing. David could have taken Saul and ended his life right there. But David didn't do it. Why? He was the Lord's anointed. Thank you. In these situations, brothers and sisters, we are not to be surmising evil. We are not to be backbiting. We are not to be critical of our brothers and sisters. Now, Consider this, as we went through this document, we have had to pass through this experience again and again. This document, Manuscript 186, is quite lengthy. But to the end of the document, she tells us that we've had to pass through this experience repeatedly. This This apostasy brought trial to us and largely increased my burdens in writing. But we must expect to meet these trials and disappointments. Just as we said as we were studying last week. Mrs. White was given a vision of a ship on the ocean that comes to encounter the iceberg. What was she told in reference to the iceberg? 
we were to meet it. Here we are being told that we must meet these trials and disappointments. The Apostle Paul warned his disciples, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock of God, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the flock of God that he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, 28 to 30. Dwight, you bring up um, uh, the iceberg. Yes. We know what was the crisis that was happening that Ellen White was addressing that needed to be met. Didn't it have something to do with the daily? No. Okay. No. Maybe, maybe very indirectly. Now it had to do with Kellogg's, uh, the omega of apost or the alpha of apostasy. Okay. Right. She calls the alpha and she talks later about the omega. Now, if you look at what she's trying to address in meeting it, how do people usually use that, uh, that vision as far as meeting it? What, what is it that people think? Cause the idea is that, that, you know, the, the ship needs to he- meet the iceberg head on, right? Because in the vision, that's what happens. It hits the iceberg and it shakes, you know, vibrates, but it, it still survives, right? Right. So what do people think about what it means to meet it when it comes to error that, that's being taught? How do they usually address it? Anybody? So if if the church was going to apply this to, let's say, those that were teaching the 2520, they would say, well, there is an error and we're going to meet it. And how would they meet it? How would they apply it? By casting casting people out. Right. But if we understand uh, what Ellen White is talking about, she was constantly calling these people to spend time together. Correct. Right. That is to resolve these errors through study, through listening, right? Because if Kellogg was going to be won back, he wasn't going to be won back by the way he was being treated by the, the ministry, right? Instead, what they did is they created this whole battleground, and the battleground was over, you know, Battle Creek and and, and um, sanitarium and all these types of things that were going on. Instead of addressing what Ellen White had been addressing for years that people needed to do. And so, you know, the work just fell apart because people weren't able to press together. So to meet something, if there's an error, you don't meet it by just attacking the person. You meet it with truth and you spend time studying in, you know, brother differs. Don't make him out to be a heretic. You know, don't misrepresent his character. And you may find that some things that he's saying have truth in them. But also you're trying to win them. You're not trying to shun them. How many of the disciples were cast out from the upper room because they held a difference of opinion? from the other disciples. Zero. So, Simon Zelotus, Simon the Zealot, who advocated the violent overthrow of the Roman occupation, remained as one of the disciples and participated with John, with James, with Nathaniel in the time in the upper room. Would that be a correct statement? Yeah. 
So even though they disagreed with Simon, they sought to find common ground through study and prayer. Would that be also correct? Yes. It affected, that, it affected Simon, too, in a positive way. Agreed. So in this, does this add to the point that Brother Theodore is making? Yes. Now, Mrs. White, in letter 48, 1897 states, I would that we could all remember much better than we have done in the past that each day we are deciding what shall be written in the books of heaven. Here again, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is Revelation 14, 15. This is after the messages of the three angels have been given. Now, each day we are deciding what is to be written in the books of heaven. Each day is a new page. Each day we make a decision either for or against Christ. Now, when does Christ sit upon the cloud? Does he sit upon the cloud before or after Revelation 15, 8? And I'll read that to you just so you can, you can consider this, all right? So Revelation 15, 8. States, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Who can enter the temple at that time? The priest is the only one he can, can enter, right? Well... Okay, the, the priest entering the temple, but what does this verse say? Did I not just read that no man was able to enter the temple? Yes, he did. So if no man can enter the temple, who can enter the temple at that time? No man. Agreed. Can Christ enter the temple at that time? No priest, no. So if Christ is sitting on the cloud, is this before the temple is filled with the glory of God, or is this after? The temple is filled with the glory of God. The after. Right. So our consideration. Is this before. Or is this after. The close of probation upon the world. After. All right. Revelation 15.8 is also a symbol. What symbol do we see 
in Revelation 15, 18. August 15. August 15th is one. What other symbol? 158 BC. Thank you. Where do we find 158 BC? On the charts. Which one of the charts? The 1843. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Isn't it on both charts? If you look carefully. Yes, it's on both. Go ahead. I had to cheat a little bit. I went in there and looked. That's what I wanted. It's on both charts, is it not? Yes, it is. So 158, as it states upon the 1843 chart, was when the Jews entered into league with Rome, right? Right. Were the Jews to enter into league with any nation around them? No, there was not. Nope. Are we to enter into league with any of the churches around us? No, we're not. No. Including the United Nations. Or the United Nations, correct. That's Adra, Adra's doing that, Adventists doing that. Now, here we are, Revelation 158. Is this representative of the final league that will be entered into where Christ's people have chosen to stand under his banner? Can you state that question again? Yeah, repeat it. So you're saying 158 is a counterfeit of the true? No, I'm saying Revelation 15, 8 is showing us that when Christ leaves the temple, his people have chosen to stand with him. Right. So that would be a league with Christ. Correct. So I'm just saying the symbol 158 BC represents a counterfeit of what is supposed exactly. to happen. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, I'd like to add that it's like a peace treaty between us and Christ, which reminds me of Isaiah 27, 5. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. My point, thank you, sister, my point out of all this is that if we are backbiting, if we are being critical, if we are tearing down our brothers and sisters, Mrs. White has said that we're doing the work of the adversary. How can we enter into league with Christ if we are doing the work of the adversary? Yeah, it's possible. You're right. It ain't possible. Men act as though they have been given special liberty to cancel the decisions of God. The higher critics put themselves in the place of God and review the word of God, revising or endorsing it. In this way, all nations are induced to drink the wine of the fornication of Babylon. These higher critics have fixed things to suit the popular heresies of these last days. If they cannot subvert and misapply the word of God, if they cannot bond it to human practices, they break it. But no man is a partaker of the divine nature will judge the word of God, for he realizes that it is the word that judges him. We cannot bring our religion to the Bible and reshape and misplace the scriptures to prove our religion true. We must obtain our religion from the word, just 
as it reads. Those who have felt at liberty to reject any portion of God's word at pleasure, trampling upon it because it does not suit the world's measure or accommodate their own practices in business deal, will find that they are handling a sword which cuts both ways. Do we really want to be handling a sword that can cut us so severely and so directly? If we are going to be critical, tearing down other brothers and sisters, casting out other brothers and sisters because what they are saying bothers us or that what they're saying and the manner in which they're saying it is not in full agreement with what we think, then are we doing what God would have us to do? All who are doers of the word of God <clears throat> will be blessed abundantly. Whatever crosses there, they must lift. Whatever losses they must sustain. Whatever persecution they may suffer, even if it be to the loss of their temporal life, they are amply recom recompensed, for they secure that life which measures with the life of God. In losing their lives for Christ's sake, they gain a life which lasts through the eternal ages. They walk under the direction of the Father of Lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Was Moses allowed to see the face of the Father when he prayed on behalf of his people? No, he was not. These that are willing to walk in the direction of the Father of Light. Mrs. White states, will see his face. Everyone that kindles his taper from the divine altar holds his lamp firmly. He does not use common fire upon his censer, but the holy fire kept burning by the power of God day and night. Those who walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who will surrender their lives to his guidance and to his servants, have the golden oil in their vessels with their lamps. They will never be placed in a position for which God has not made provision. The lamp of life is always trimmed by the very hand that lit it. In America, we've just come through what is called Thanksgiving. This paragraph gives us each a reason for Thanksgiving. Those that would be considered as wise virgins will walk in the footsteps of Jesus. They will surrender their lives to his guidance and to his service. And they will have this golden oil in their vessels, in their character, to give light to others. Now, all of these things we must be willing to consider. Angels weep to see the precious truth of heavenly origin cast before swine to be seized by them and trampled with the mire and the dirt. Cast not your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. These are the words of the world's Redeemer. God's ministers should not count the opportunity of engaging in discussion a, a great privilege. All points of our faith are not to be borne to the front and presented before the prejudiced crowds. Jesus spoke before the Pharisees and the Sadducees in parables, hiding the clearness 
of the truth under symbols and figures because they would make a wrong use of the truths he presented before them. But to his disciples, his disciples, he spoke plainly. We should learn from Christ's method of teaching and be careful not to cut off the ears of the people by presenting truths, which not fully explained, they are in no way prepared to receive. So many times over these last 18 years, there have been many that have been ready to cast out those that choose to study from the charts, that have chosen and accepted the warnings of the seven times of Leviticus 26, because they are suspicious of the number 2520. Yet, how many more other items are there on these charts to which they cannot set aside? We know we are not to enter into a league with the nations around us. We are not to enter into a league with the churches around us. We are not to work closely with the United Nations. We are not to accept and work to understand spiritual formation. For when we do, we are setting aside the teachings of Scripture. The truths we hold in common should be first dwelt upon and the confidence of the hearers obtained that we can advance slowly as the people can be brought along with the matter presented. Great wisdom is needed to present unpopular truth before a prejudiced people in the most cautious manner, that they may gain access to their hearts. Discussions placed before the people who are unenlightened in regard to our position and who are ignorant of Bible truth, a set of arguments skillfully gotten up and carefully arranged to cover over the clear points of truth. Some men have made it their business to cover up plain statements of fact in the word of God by their deceptive theories, which they make plausible to those who have not investigated for themselves. One of the big points that has been addressed over these many years is do not take my word for what I say. Investigate this for yourself. Address this simply. Put it before the people in such a manner that their curiosity and their desire to confirm what is said may be ignited. We have much yet to address, but our time is running short. Do you have any other comments or questions based upon what we have covered today? Any other thoughts that we should address? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we ask today for your forgiveness of our sins, for any that are offended, Father, I seek to be restored to them. It is not my purpose to offend. It is not my desire to offend. Yet, we know that your word is a sharp sword that can cut both ways. Help us, Father, that this sharp sword may remove from us our unbelief. 
Guide us now. Direct us in all things. May your will be done. Help us now as we continue in this Sabbath. Be with Theodore in the message that he is about to give. Direct Sister Heidi as she gives her testimony. Be with us all so that we may stand with you on the sea of glass. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.